Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 53, The Bosporan Kingdom, Greeks of the Crimea. The Black Sea is an often neglected area when it comes to the broader framework of the ancient world. And at the same time, it can provide us with unusual case studies that prove to be extremely interesting. The Bosporan Kingdom, centered along the modern Strait of Kerch, was a curious mixture of cultures and peoples. During the Hellenistic period, it was largely settled by Greek colonists, ruled by a dynasty of Thracians known as the Spartacids, and was closely tied to the nomadic steppe tribes like the Scythians and Sarmatians. In some ways, the Bosporians can be considered among the first examples of a Hellenistic society, largely isolated from the affairs of the successor kingdoms until their independence came to an end in the 1st century BC. In this episode, we will talk about the history of the Bosporus and the Spartakids, their relations with the wider Greek and Hellenistic world, and end our mini-series on Asia Minor and the Black Sea. The Black Sea region was something of a wild west a frontier land inhabited with dangers both real and imagined. Sailing the Euxine Pontus could be quite treacherous, and while it translates to the Friendly Sea, this was more of an ironic name bequeathed upon the Black Sea after it had been tamed by Greek settlers. Exploration was originally limited to heroes of legend, such as the strongman Heracles or the unfaithful Jason and his Argonauts, who had to deal with monsters and wild women like the Amazons or the witch Medea. Besides the realm of myth, there were actual barbarian tribes living along or near the coastline that performed human sacrifice and turned skulls into drinking cups. Yet by the 6th century, a large number of expeditions organized by Ionian Greeks planted colonies, Apoikiae, around the Black Sea, and its northernmost part would be where the seeds of the Bosporan Kingdom would be planted. To clear up any possible confusion, in antiquity there were two Bosporuses. There is what we generally classify as the Bosporus, the strait which links the Black Sea and the Sea of Marmara in western Turkey. Then there is the Cimmerian Bosporus, named after the nomadic steppe tribes of the early Iron Age, which is equivalent to the modern Kerch Strait. The strait connects the Black Sea to the Sea of Azov, known in antiquity as Lake Myotis, and separates the eastern Crimean Peninsula in Ukraine from the Taman Peninsula in Russia. It also gets problematic when Bosphorus is often interchanged for Bosphorus. So I'm going to stick with Bosphorus from this point on and refer to the kingdom as the Bosporan Kingdom. Colonization of the Cimmerian Bosphorus began in the first half of the 6th century BC on the initiative of the prominent Ionian city of Miletus, which had already had past success settling the Pontic region. The reasons for doing so tend to vary depending upon the author some arguing that it was for more arable land, some due to political turbulence in the mother cities, and some arguing that they wanted to take advantage of the trading opportunities of the northern Black Sea. It is generally assumed that there were three waves of colonization. In the first half of the 6th century, due to the expansion of the Lydian Kingdom, in the second half, following the conquest of the Persian Empire, and in the first quarter of the 5th century, due to the failure of the Ionian Revolt and the subsequent destruction of Miletus. The reverence of the Bosporians towards their Milesian origins could still be seen on their coinage centuries later, which bore the image of a lion's head in a similar style to that of their mother city. Among the most important settlements founded during this period were Nephium, Ermanasa, and Pentacopium, the modern city of Kerch. Instead of bearing the appearance of a classical or Hellenistic Greek city, these early colonies were rather modest and built with local materials instead of stone. Several of these dwellings were also partially subterranean, a local adaptation to the region's sometimes brutal winters. But the Greeks were not the only major cultural presence within the northern Black Sea region. There were the native inhabitants just bordering the Sea of Azov, peoples like the Maotians to the north, and the Sindian kingdom to the east. Some of the tribes proved to be particularly annoying, like the Taurians, who were avid pirates and would routinely sacrifice prisoners and shipwreck survivors to their gods. Still, a much more significant presence could be seen with two groups. The first are the tribes of the steppes, the nomadic or semi-nomadic horse-rearing peoples that lived along the grasslands directly bordering the Bosporus, a region known as the Pontic Caspian Steppe. We discussed them in considerable detail in episode 51, so do check that out if you haven't already. The nomads had long dwelled within this region, the first major tribe being the Cimmerians who were eventually driven off or settled thanks to the Scythians 
who began to arrive in greater numbers during the 6th century. Strabo claims that the Greeks had been responsible for driving out the Scythians settled on the Bosphorus, though some modern scholars question the existence of a stable native population in this territory. It was also posited by a later Byzantine writer that the city of Pantacopium was a gift for the Greeks from a Scythian king. While some tribes raided and were met with hostility, others preferred to maintain a strong commercial relationship. The Scythians and other nomads could provide large amounts of prisoners to feed the ever-constant demand for slaves by Bosporan traders, who could command a considerable price from the slave markets of the Mediterranean. The Bosporians would later establish the port of Tanais at the mouth of the Don River to help facilitate the exchange of goods between them and the tribes. Cleobule, the mother of the 4th century Athenian orator Demosthenes, was said to be of Bosporan Greek and Scythian descent, suggesting that there might have been some degree of social mixing between the nomads and the settled societies. The Bosporus was abundant in its natural resources. Fish and salt were among its top exports, along with other agricultural products like honey and livestock, which could often be exchanged in order to import vast amounts of wine. However, the most important commodity of the northern Pontic region was its grain, produced in considerable amounts by both the Bosporan Greeks and the peoples ruled over by the Scythians in nearby Olbia just off the Dnieper River. The grain trade probably began by the early 5th century BC, and the Bosporians' most famous customers would be Athens, which created strong ties that would likely dominate the foreign policy of the North Pontic Greeks throughout the 5th and 4th centuries. Despite the economic and social links between the two communities, it is possible that the threat of nomadic attack inspired a massive political change among the various colonies of the Bosporus. In the late 6th century, some of the cities of the Kerch Strait had organized themselves into a singular political body with Pentecopium at its head, forming the prototype for the Bosporan state. Unfortunately, the history of this region is very poorly documented, as the sources only mention the Bosporus either at a glance or when it is directly relevant with the wider Mediterranean Greek world. Much of the narrative is speculative or poorly detailed, so I apologize in advance if it feels like I'm jumping around quite a bit. The pseudo-unification of the Bosporan cities came at a time of great upheaval for the Black Sea region. In 494, Miletus was destroyed in retaliation for its participation in the Ionian Revolt against the Persian Empire, which had also undertaken military campaigns into Europe against the Scythians nearly 20 years before. As far as Herodotus tells us, there doesn't seem to be any indication that Persia attempted to subjugate the Bosporan Greeks directly. Still, the threat of an imperial power was no small matter and it is quite possible that the Persians exerted some sort of political pressure over the region, or perhaps employed mercenaries against them. It is also possible that there was a renewed attack on the Bosporan cities by the Scythians as a consequence of being driven off by the Persian campaigns. Archaeological evidence dating to the early 5th century does suggest hostility between the two groups, with the construction of new fortress walls in multiple Greek cities that suffered significant damage by fire, and there were remains of old walls peppered with Scythian arrows. There may have even been a degree of social upheaval following the influx of immigrants and refugees from Miletus. Whatever the case may be, in about 480 BC, Pentecopium fell under the sway of a tyranny headed by the Archaeanactidae, a clan of Milesian origin. Diodorus calls them Bosporan kings, but this is probably due to his first century perspective, and it is almost certain that they were only tyrants. At the same time, we know almost nothing about the Archaeanactids beyond the fact that they ruled about 42 years. In the year 438, the Archaeanactids were overthrown by a man known as Spartacus or Spartacus. The exact nature of this power grab remains largely a mystery, but there are several interesting pieces of evidence that can maybe give us a hint as to what happened. The name Spartacus and any of its variations are not Greek in origin. In fact, it is distinctly Thracian. For those who remember, the famous gladiator general of the Third Servile War is also named Spartacus, and was said to be from Thrace. At about the same time as Spartacus's coup, the Odrysian kingdom in Thrace had unified under the rule of Teres, becoming one of the most powerful and wealthy political entities of the mid-late 5th century, and especially during the time of Teres' successor, Setalkes. We discussed this in episode 49 along with the history of the Adrisians, but it is interesting to note that the brother of Setalkis was named Sparadokos. Based on the evidence, it is certainly attractive to think that a member of the Odrysian royal house had taken advantage of the political turmoil of the Bosporus to install one of their own. This is all speculative, mind you, but it is probably no coincidence that in 437 BC, 
the Athenian statesman Pericles undertook a Ponte expedition. Plutarch is the only one to have written about it, and there is no direct mention of the Bosporan cities. Still, given that Athens' interest in the Pontic grain trade and the close ties it had with the Adrisian royal house, it is very possible that the two events are connected. Along with the steppe peoples, it appears that the Thracians were the other great non-Greek cultural presence intimately involved with the Bosporians, and 438 marks the beginning of the unified Bosporan state. Spartacus would be the first in a series of rulers from the house that bears his name, the Spartacid dynasty, for his descendants would move from tyrants to kings of the Bosporus. Molon Lape, come and take them. It was with these famous words that King Leonidas of Sparta spurned the surrender offered by the Persian king Xerxes. Instead, by his refusal, he chose the immortalization of his people's legend. Hi. I'm Steve, the host of Spartan History Podcast, where I take a chronological look at the Spartan people's beginnings in the mythic age and carry the story right through to their military dominance of classical Greece and beyond. Please check out my website at spartanhistorypodcast.com. All of my podcasts are freely available wherever you get your pods from. Come and take them. After being in charge and residing at his capital city of Pentacopium for at least five years, Spartacus died and was succeeded by his son Satyrus in 433-432. Satyrus is the first of the Bosporan rulers that we have any considerable information about, no doubt because of his lengthy reign of about 45 years, which was marked by territorial expansion and economic growth. The increasing Athenian dependence on Bosporan grain as the Peloponnesian War rolled on meant that money was flowing into the Spartac coffers, which presumably was able to fund the military. In the earlier centuries, traditional hoplites would form the bulk of the army. Over time, they gradually incorporated units that were comprised of non-Greeks. There is strong evidence that Thracian warriors were employed as either cavalrymen or as light infantry, Never mind the likelihood that the Spartacids had some form of political or military connections to their ancestral homeland. Of additional use were the mounted archers that could be recruited from the tribes of the steppes, either for their own sake or as a way to counteract other horse archers. Perhaps the strength in military and financial backing allowed Satyrus to expand his control by forcibly seizing Nymphium in the southern Crimea during the late 4th century. Nymphium was a Greek city that had not been part of the original Bosporan hegemony, and it was a clear sign that the new rulers were taking on a more militaristic attitude than had their Greek predecessors. Spartacid control was expanding on the European and Asiatic side of the Bosporus, encountering resistance from both Greek and non-Greek peoples alike. Less successfully, Satyrus would also wage war on the kingdom of the Sindhi, a Maeotian people on the Taman Peninsula. He apparently attempted to install a puppet monarch vis-a-vis -a, -vis a marriage alliance but this backfired and resulted in an open conflict with the Scindians. It is likely that an expansionist policy was being enacted to keep up with the increased demands for grain by Athens, which in turn would require the Bosporians to acquire more arable land to farm on. Satyrus died in 389-388, probably during an attempted siege of nearby Theodosia, whereupon his sons, Lucan and Gorgippus, would share the throne. Lucan would continue his father's plans by besieging Theodosia again, which was a Greek settlement which held immense value as a port for both trading and military matters. This attracted the attention of Theodosia's southern ally Heraclea Pontica, who attempted to land on the Bosporus and meet Lucan's army to lift the siege. The Heracleots were soon driven back thanks to Lucan's generalship and employment of Scythian cavalry, and the city was soon absorbed into the kingdom to be turned into a massive grain emporium. This war has a couple of references, mainly in the work of Polyinus and his stratagems, but dating results in a range from the start date of 389 to a possible end in 354. It seems that Lucan had also followed through with his father's aims to expand into the Asiatic side of the Bosporus by conquering the Sindhi as well. The middle of the 4th century provides us with the clearest picture regarding the relationship between the Bosporan kingdom and Athens. The dependency by the latter upon the former was no doubt exacerbated by the reduction of Athenian naval power following the conclusion of the Peloponnesian War and the dissolution of the Delian League, then again by the defeat at Chaeronea by Philip II of Macedon. Our main source on this relationship is the orator Demosthenes, and as I mentioned earlier, his family had ancestral ties to the Black Sea. His mother, Cleobule, was from the Bosphorus. His grandfather Gilon was the one in charge of Nymphium and responsible for returning the city over to Satyrus I, and Demosthenes may have even taken a wife from the Spartacid royal house. 
Much of his rhetoric is unabashedly pro-Spartacid in tone, describing the generous contributions of grain by Lucan and urging a lifting of taxes from Bosporan imports. This also coincides with the gifting of Athenian citizenship on members of the Spartacid dynasty, an already established practice that was done with the Odrysian royalty to help assist with Athens' foreign policy. Since I keep describing the Spartacids as rulers, let me pose a question. When can we properly describe them as kings? Both Spartacus I and Satyrus I were considered tyrants, strong men with enough military, economic, or political backing to become the dominant leader in a particular city or government. During the time of Lucan, this seems to have changed. We can see that he received the title Archon, a Greek term referring to an elected magistrate like what was practiced in Athens, though it is somewhat marred by the fact that Archons were usually annual positions, while Lucan's was for life. This could certainly help legitimize him in the eyes of his Greek subjects or with trading partners and allies, and his full title reflects this as Archon of the Bosporus and Theodosia. Now, the curious thing is that while he was presented as a magistrate to the Greeks, Lucan was also described as a king, but only for the various tribes within the region, Myotian peoples like the Sindhi, Dandarii, and the Toretti. This is a remarkable aspect of the Bosporan kingdom, because long before Alexander and his successors, we can already see that the Spartacids were deliberately presenting themselves in different ways to compensate for the multiple cultures and peoples that resided within their domain. In many ways, this also reflects the importance of Lucan as a ruler, someone who was clearly able to expand his borders and bring in vast quantities of money from the grain trade. Though we refer to the dynasty as Spartacid, in antiquity, they would instead be known as the Luconidae. Much of the wealth would go towards the development of Pentacopium as an urbanized city with stone fortifications and buildings, more in line with the Hellenistic settlements of the successor kingdoms. As a testament to its status as a royal capital, Pentacopium possesses inscriptions that tend to relate to the importance of the Spartac kings as the foundation of law and order. Governors could be appointed, or they could be staffed by younger family members similar in function to the paradynasties of the Odrysian kingdom. There was also a pattern of co-regency, either between father and son or with brother and brother, and usually the senior ruler would be given control of Pentacopium while the lesser received Theodosia. Overall, this seems to be a reasonably stable form of government. If we judge a dynasty by the regnal lengths of each of its kings, then the Spartacids come out pretty favorably. Still, no family is without its squabbles. So let us turn to the last third of this episode, where we will see how the Bosporians coped with the coming of the Hellenistic world. similar in practice to those of the successor kingdoms would only occur after Lucan's death in 349-348, after 40 years of rule. Once again, there was a succession by two sons, Spartacus II and Pyrrhusades I, but Spartacus would die less than five years later. Pyrrhusades has little information about him, but during his long reign of three decades, he managed to avoid the conquests of Philip II and Alexander the Great. In the meanwhile, he had proven himself a capable general like his father, expanding the Bosporan kingdom by taking much of the eastern coast of the Sea of Azov up to the Don River. The wars of the Diadochoi also diverted the attention from possible competitors like King Lysimachus I in Thrace, all the way down to the year 310, when Pyrrhusades died. But instead of a peaceful accession of a new ruler, as had been the pattern for the Spartacids since the dynasty took power over a century before, the Bosporan kingdom found itself embroiled in a civil war. Pyrrhusades had three sons, Pratanus, Eumilus, and Satyrus, and it appears that there was something of a disagreement as to who was in charge. Being the eldest son, Satyrus II was made king upon death of his father. The youngest, Eumilus, attempted to overthrow his older brother by amassing an army through an alliance with Ariphernes, king of the nomadic Siraki's tribe. Now, a Spartacid ruler employing tribesmen of the steppe was nothing new by this point, as Satyrus would bring mounted warriors to battle as well. But as we discussed in a previous episode, the late 4th century was the start of a transformative experience for the Pontic Caspian steppe. There was the gradual influx and eastern migration of new nomadic tribes, known collectively as the Sarmatians, of which the Syracis belonged to. The Sarmatians would come into conflict with the Scythians until they became the dominant power on the steppe and Eumilus was directly taking advantage of the hostility between the two groups to try and disrupt his brother's power base. In their first engagement, 
Satyrus managed to send Eumelus and Ariferenes fleeing back to the Siraki's territory to hide out in the Sarmatians' fortified capital near the Sea of Azov. Though he was able to plunder the countryside, Satyrus had immense difficulties trying to deal with the city's defenses and the swamps that hindered his progress. In an effort to save one of his commanders, Satyrus was mortally wounded during the siege and died only nine months into his reign. Eumelus was probably both shocked and relieved upon hearing the news, but he now had to contend with Pertanis, who had been left behind in Patacapayum and proclaimed king. It appears that Pertanis was not as militarily capable as his brothers and was defeated in battle, forcing him to submit and voluntarily vacate the throne to Eumelus in exchange for his life. He did try to rally the citizens of Pentecopium to reinstate him as king, but this was a big mistake. Eumelus showed no mercy, and had Pertanis killed, and the supporters and families of his brothers were also massacred. Understandably, the Bosporians were more than a little upset at King Eumelus for instigating a civil war and murdering his citizenry, but through tax exemptions and legitimately good leadership, such as eliminating piracy in the Black Sea, Eumelus was able to earn their goodwill and rule, for about five and a half years. Then he is said to have died because of a freak accident involving an out-of-control wagon that was heading over a ravine, and when he tried to leap from it, his sword got caught in the spokes of the wheel and promptly carried him to an early death. Unfortunately, the death of Eumelus and the accession of his son, Spartacus III in 304-303, conclude the account of Diodorus on the affairs of the Bosporan kingdom. This leaves us with a very empty hole in the narrative from this point until the final years of the Spartacid dynasty, and even with coins and inscriptions, it is still extremely difficult to present a general sequence of the Order of the Kings. Instead of an overall narrative, we can conclude our discussion by looking at the changes that occurred during the Hellenistic period, which we can detect in the archaeological evidence. In spite of the proclamations of the generals of Alexander as kings in 306, it appears that the Spartacids were relatively slow to follow. The title of Archon remained in use until the late 3rd century, when we start to properly see the use of titles like Basileus in a similar model to other Hellenistic monarchs. The coinage had changed considerably as well. Under Lucan I in the mid-4th century, Pentecopium issued a number of coins that bore the image of the god Panon on the front, which is probably not a coincidence given the shared name. The reverse had a gold guarding griffin standing over a stalk of wheat, demonstrating a clear understanding of where the king's prosperity lay along with the mythological creature that was associated with the East, or even the Scythians. By the late 3rd century, we begin to see specimens that are more in line with the typical Hellenistic format, which are almost certainly modeled after the famous tetradrachms minted by Lysimachus I, bearing the image of a horned Alexander the Great. At the same time, many of the Spartacid coins had bows and arrows on the reverse, a symbol of authority among nomadic societies. Given the importance of the nomads within the region, the adoption of Scythian or Sarmatian elements into the kingship model is not unlikely. Given the multicultural and multi-ethnic nature of the Bosporan kingdom, there are a number of signs that ideas were being exchanged among the various peoples living there. The city of Pentecopium played host to a number of cults which could worship syncretized deities of Greek and native pantheons. One of them is Parthenos, a protector goddess of the Greek cities of the Crimea that appears to be associated with Artemis or the Roman Diana. Whether she can be associated with the goddess of the Tarian peoples who demanded the sacrifice of washed-up sailors is currently under debate. Aphrodite Oronea was revered as a fertility goddess, and her cult originated in the Bosporus, but there was also the imported worship of foreign cults like the Egyptian Isis and the Ephesian Artemis. One of the more unique creatures to emerge out of the Black Sea is the Mixoparthenos, a mermaid-like creature that is the top half of a maiden and a double fishtail at the bottom. If you tend to order out coffee, then you have likely seen her. She is the logo of the Starbucks Corporation. One of the most striking consequences of the exchange between the various cultures of the Northern Black Sea can be seen with its art. The region produced some marvelous terracotta figures, such as oil jars shaped like Aphrodite emerging from a clamshell or a female sphinx. Close contact with the Scythians resulted in the creation of designs called Greco-Scythian, a blending of Greek realism with nomadic animal style which showed intimate scenes like hunting or warfare on beautifully worked gold and silver pieces. Since these have been mostly found on the graves of Scythians located near or within the borders of the Bosporan kingdom, it is assumed that Greek metal workers within the cities were commissioned by the Scythian nobles. The level of detail and accuracy of these pieces also suggests that the artists themselves were extremely familiar with nomadic culture, 
or they were able to easily acquire props of some kind. The burial practices of the Bosporians are also very interesting. There are traditional Scythian kurgans that surround the Kirk Strait, but there are also Scythian or Thracian-style tombs found within the cemeteries of Panticapium. The largest of these is the Royal Kurgan, an enormous tomb located within the city limits that has the outward appearance of a Scythian tomb, yet contains several elements of Greek craftsmanship and design. Still, there are some burials of Greek citizens that explicitly use native customs like wooden or marble sarcophagi, which contain Scythian arrows and weaponry. Though the Civil War of 310 was rather dramatic, the internal politics of the Bosporan Kingdom was largely peaceful, minus one or two instances of dynastic bickering. But the 3rd and 2nd century saw the gradual decline of Spartacid prestige and wealth. While they no longer held the monopoly over the grain trade thanks to new competitors like the Ptolemies in Egypt, it is unlikely that such a decline was due to a lack of potential customers. The encroachment of the Sarmatians into the territory of the Scythians destabilized the Pontic-Caspian steppe, disrupting the established commercial relationship while also driving those Scythians into conflict with the Greek cities as they looked for new places to settle. Things got particularly messy during the reign of Pyrocades V in the late 2nd century, when he was being forced to make large payments to the local tribes as bribes to not attack. The instability made it the perfect target for the up-and-coming ruler from a kingdom of the southern Pontic region, Mithridates VI Eupator. Rather than outright conquest, Mithridates responded to a cry for help from his allied city of Chersonesus Taurike to deal with the Scythian threat. He sent his general Diophantus, who successfully managed to best the tribes in roughly 111-109 and forced them to ally with the kingdom of Pontus, and the Chersonesus fell under Mithridates' control. In 106 BC, Diophantus was sent to Pentecopium, whereby he negotiated with Pyrocades to step down from the throne. It is suggested that the success of the commander against the nomads had persuaded the Spartacid king to hand over the reins of the kingdom for protection, but one must wonder if the weight of inevitability from the ambitious Mithridates was also used as leverage. Either way, Pyrocades would abdicate the throne, the last of the Spartacid dynasty to rule the Bosporus. Under Mithridates' reign, the Bosporan kingdom became something of a quasi-client state while he sent family members there to insert themselves into the seat of government. Though Mithridates was driven out by internal revolts and his subsequent defeat by the Roman Republic, the Bosporus continued to be ruled by his descendants for almost 400 years after his death. It would remain a client state to Rome, enjoying a degree of peace down to the late 4th century AD. The Bosporan kingdom was a remarkable place, and despite the general lack of information from the sources, it appears to be a rather dynamic and well-organized state. Although there was a strong possibility for conflict between the settled Greeks and the nomadic tribes, such confrontations were generally limited until the final years of the kingdom's independence, and for the most part there was a somewhat amicable coexistence. The Spartacids, despite their barbarian heritage, were in some ways the prototype for the Hellenistic monarchs. A general pattern of stability can be seen for over 330 years of their rule, and their effective management brought tremendous wealth and prosperity to the North Pontic region. What had once been the Wild West was now tamed and brought into the larger fold of the Greek world. Yet, it continued to carry forward several of the traditions of the nomadic tribes of the steppes and other peoples native to the region. I hope with the last few episodes I have been able to give you a taste of what the Black Sea was like during the Hellenistic Age. I strongly encourage all of my listeners to check out the transcript for this episode, which are available in the show notes on my website and contain all of my sources and citations in the footnotes. Before you go, I have a few brief announcements to make regarding upcoming episodes. With that said, I really hope you enjoyed this episode, and I apologize for the slight delay in the release. If you like what you heard, consider supporting the show by leaving a review or by donating to the show's Ko-Fi page or grabbing a show bookmark from Etsy. Also, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, etc. to get show updates. Now, for those that don't keep up with me on my social media, let me give you an idea of the show's direction for the rest of this year and into the next. We will be returning back to the Hellenistic Big Three, with about 7-10 to 10 episodes dedicated to the Seleucids, Ptolemies, and Antigonids. Instead of just doing narrative-style shows, I am also going to go much more in-depth. We will talk about the inner workings of the Seleucid world, daily life as either a Greek or an Egyptian under the Ptolemies, the first fragmentation of the Seleucid Empire and the rise of Parthia and Bactria, the end of the glory days of Ptolemaic Egypt, and the troubles in Greece with the final march of the Spartans under Cleomenes III. 
I hope that I've piqued your interest with those little teasers. So, until next time, you've been listening to The Hellenistic Age Podcast.